Hello and welcome to this A-level chemistry video about preparing and purifying organic compounds. These are both important things for the required practicals for AQA and for the practical activity groups for OCR. In this video, we'll look at how and why we carry out a variety of processes involved in organic synthesis, and in some cases focus in on how they can go wrong. I will cover distillation, reflux, focus in specifically on the preparation of aspirin and how we can purify it using recrystallization and test its purity. And then in terms of organic liquids, as well as already looking at reflux, we'll focus on how we separate organic and aqueous layers, how we wash them and how we use drying agents to remove those last traces of water. We carry out the process of refluxing for a variety of different organic syntheses. For instance, we might want to do a full oxidation of an alcohol to produce a carboxylic acid. And when we do this, we have our reaction mixture in a round bottomed flask or a pear shaped flask. And if we were producing a carboxylic acid from our alcohol, this reaction mixture would be the alcohol that we were oxidizing concentrated sulfuric acid to act as a catalyst and an excess of our oxidizing agent, probably potassium dichromate. And then we would connect a condenser to our reaction flask and this condenser must be in the vertical position and it should be clamped and we should also clamp the reaction mixture to make sure there's no dangerous slipping of the apparatus which could cause an accident. When we do the reflux, it's really important that we heat our reaction mixture using some kind of heating mantle or hot plate or maybe a hot water bath. What's really important is that we don't use any naked flames because most organic substances are highly flammable and so this could be potentially hazardous for this reason. In addition to this, it's important that we have some anti-bumping granules in our reaction mixture. And these ensure that the bubbles that get created are smaller bubbles, and this stops the reaction from being too violent. The condenser itself is actually a vertical glass tube with a cooling jacket around it. And this cooling jacket is filled with water. And the water comes in at the bottom of the condenser and goes out at the top. The reason that we do this is that it ensures that the water totally fills the condenser and this makes sure that the vapours cool and condense in the right positions in the equipment. If the water went in at the top and out at the bottom, this means that the condenser wouldn't fill properly and so the vapours wouldn't cool as quickly and so they might escape. And this could be potentially hazardous and it would certainly decrease our yield. When we carry out a reflux, we take our mixture of liquids and we heat them at their boiling points for a prolonged period of time. And because we're heating at their boiling points, some of the liquids will turn into gas and so we will form a vapour which will escape from the liquid mixture and rise up in the condenser. And gradually these vapours will cool and they will condense back into a liquid and then they will return down into the original liquid mixture rather than being lost out of the top of our condenser. So we're reacting these liquids at a high temperature but for no loss of our product. The condensation of the vapours should take place around about halfway up the condenser or two thirds of the way up at the absolute most. Even though this is what we're expecting to happen, it's important that we don't fully seal our condenser because just in case we heat it too violently, that might lead to the buildup of pressure inside our apparatus and this could be highly dangerous potentially. And so we don't seal our condenser at the top, but it is really important that there are no gaps further down our apparatus, because if there were gaps, some of our vapours could escape. And again, this could be dangerous and certainly reduce our yield. Once we've finished our reflux reaction, it will be necessary to separate out the reactants from the products. And we would probably use distillation to do this. And then we will probably want to test the purity of our products. First and foremost, this is likely to be through the testing of the melting point or the boiling point. 
and we might also carry out some chemical testing proving either the presence of a particular functional group, for instance the carboxylic acid, or maybe testing for the absence of a functional group from either our reactant or possibly a potential side product, so proving that there is no longer the alcohol functional group present or that we haven't made some of the aldehyde functional group. Distillation is done to separate a mixture of liquids which have got different boiling points. Or we can use distillation to prepare an organic liquid and immediately separate it out from the reactants that we made it out of. For instance, we might want to produce an aldehyde or a ketone from an alcohol and then immediately separate it from the alcohol reactant. Whatever the purpose of this distillation, the method is still the same. This is a diagram of the apparatus that you would use to carry out a distillation. And you need to understand what happens in each part of the apparatus, as well as being able to draw the apparatus for yourself. On the left hand side we've got a round bottom flask and inside that flask is our reaction mixture. And this reaction mixture would be different if we were preparing a halogenoalkane or an alkene or if we were trying to oxidise an alcohol. For the oxidation of an alcohol to an aldehyde or a ketone we would need to have our alcohol in the reaction mixture and our oxidising agent, the potassium dichromate, and some concentrated sulfuric acid to act as a catalyst. We would also need to use some anti-bumping granules, and these are tiny grains made from silicon or calcium compounds, and they help to create smaller bubbles, and so prevent the bubbling from being too vigorous, which prevents the mixture from jumping over into the condenser, which is what we refer to as bumping. Now the process of distillation requires us to heat our reaction mixture and since most organic substances are flammable it's important that we don't use any naked flames. And so that means that we will be heating our reaction mixture with a heating mantle or a hot plate or potentially a hot water bath. If we use a hot water bath, we are limited to heating our reaction mixture up to a maximum of 100 degrees C. And so this is only appropriate if we're trying to boil something whose boiling point is less than 100 degrees C. And so we will heat our reaction mixture to the boiling point of one of our chemicals. And at this temperature, this chemical will turn from a liquid into a gas. And of course, the chemical with the lower boiling point will evaporate first and leave the liquid mixture and rise up out of the round bottom flask. From there, it will encounter our thermometer, and this will help us know what the temperature is of the gases that is moving through into the condenser. And so, for instance, if we know that our product has got a boiling point of 50 degrees C and our reactant has got a boiling point of 80 degrees C, we know that provided we keep our temperature above 50 degrees C but below 80 degrees C, this will allow us to produce vapours of our product rather than our reactant. And so if we have got chemicals that have got more similar boiling points than this, we might need to use fractional distillation instead of simple distillation to allow for more careful and sensitive separation of these liquids if their boiling points are really similar. From here, our vapours will move into the condenser, and the condenser is a glass tube with a water jacket around it. And the water goes into the condenser from the lower entry point and it comes out of the top. And this ensures that the water fills the condenser fully, and that means that the condenser is cold enough to condense the vapours and turn those gases back into liquids. And at this point we'll get liquids forming in our condenser and these liquids will run down through the condenser and they will collect in some kind of suitable collection vessel that is underneath the condensing tube. And to help us to condense those vapours further, we might have our conical flask or boiling tube inside some kind of container of ice. And that will make sure that the vapours don't escape from the collection flask without fully condensing. 
The liquid that collects in the conical flask is called the distillate, and ideally this would be a pure substance, 100% of the product that we're hoping to get, without any of the reactant or other organic byproduct moving over and condensing along with our target molecule. We can always test the purity of our product by measuring its boiling point to see if it is pure by looking for a sharp or specific boiling point. We can also test it by doing a chemical test to prove that we have got a specific functional group and also prove that it isn't contaminated by an additional functional group. When we draw the diagram of our apparatus, it's important that this is not fully sealed because if it is fully sealed, there will be a buildup of pressure during the distillation, and that could be very dangerous and potentially even explosive if enough pressure built up. But whilst that's really crucial, it's important that the gaps in your apparatus to prevent this buildup are late on in the distillation, on the right hand side, either inside the actual collection vessel itself, so basically there is no bung at the top of the conical flask, or just after the condenser to allow any vapours to escape. Earlier on in the apparatus, it's really important that that part is sealed because if our vapors escape before they've moved around into the condenser, we will definitely have a lower yield than we would prefer. Exam questions might show you a diagram of a distillation and they could ask you to identify some mistakes that have been made and to explain some problems that this could potentially cause. And one really common problem that they put into these diagrams is the water going in and out the wrong way round. And so you would need to say that in this instance the water would not fill the condenser properly and so that means that the condenser would not be cold enough to ensure that the gas fully condenses and turns into a liquid and so the yield would be reduced. And you can see that from the diagram that I've drawn here, my condenser is only about 50% filled with water and that's the problem that comes with having the water going in at the top. When the water goes in at the bottom, that condensing jacket is fully filled with water and that ensures efficient cooling of the vapours. You need to know how to describe and explain the steps involved in the preparation of an organic solid. And the most common focus of an exam question about this is the preparation of aspirin. And so that's what I'm going to focus on here. To do this, we start with a solid. We start with salicylic acid. And so the first stage of this synthesis is to weigh out the correct amount of salicylic acid using a balance and a weighing boat. And so I'm showing here that I'm weighing out six grams of salicylic acid. The precise quantities can, of course, vary. And then we transfer this solid into a conical flask, possibly through a funnel, but we can certainly transfer it carefully. The reaction is going to take place in this conical flask. But before we start the reaction, we need to make sure we know exactly how much of our solid has been transferred into the conical flask. So what we do is we re-weigh the weighing boat and we see if we've left behind any of that salicylic acid. And so you can see from my diagram here, I'm illustrating the idea that I've left behind 0.03 grams of this salicylic acid. And so this second measurement allows me to sort of weigh by difference and find out that I've actually only added 5.97 grams of salicylic acid. So this is a more exact mass of solid that's been transferred into the conical flask. And then we move on to the chemical reaction itself. So I need to introduce my source of the acyl group for aspirin. So I'm going to add 10 cm cubed of ethanoic anhydride. In theory, we could use ethanoyl chloride as well, but this would be a much more violent reaction, harder to control, and it would produce toxic HCl fumes. Ethanoic anhydride doesn't react as well as ethanoyl chloride does, so we need to use a concentrated acid catalyst, and we would use phosphoric acid, which we'd need to be really careful handling because it is corrosive, and we'd need to make sure that we didn't add too much of it, so five or so drops would be plenty. And we could also potentially wear gloves to provide a barrier for our skin to prevent it coming into contact with this phosphoric acid. 
The reaction itself is quite slow, and so we in fact need to warm it at about 60 degrees C for 20 minutes or so. And so we could put our conical flask into a water bath that is on a hot plate, or we could just use the hot plate directly. Hot plates are potentially a little bit easier to control the temperature of rather than a water bath, but it is important that we don't use any naked flames. After that time has passed, we would add some ice cold water to our reaction mixture and then put the mixture itself into an ice bath and that will mean our solid will crystallize and we will get our aspirin forming and it will sort of crash out of solution at this stage. And using ice ensures that we get a higher yield of aspirin than if we just allowed this crystallization to take place at room temperature and we also get the crystals faster as well. The next stage is to separate our crude aspirin through the process of filtration because of course we've got our aspirin product suspended in our reaction mixture. So we could use gravity filtration but vacuum filtration or filtration under reduced pressure as it's sometimes referred to is preferable. And then having done that, we would leave our crystals to dry either on the filter itself, allowing the vacuum to gradually dry our crystals more and more, or we could leave it somewhere warm in our room and give that time to fully dry. And then the final stage of this is to weigh this crude aspirin and calculate an early percentage yield, knowing that we are probably going to have to further purify it and calculate that yield again afterwards. The process of recrystallization is carried out with impure solids to try and increase their percentage purity. You start by taking your impure organic solid, which might contain both insoluble and soluble impurities. The first thing that we need to do is dissolve our organic solid in the minimum volume possible of hot solvent. It's important that we use the minimum volume because this allows us to achieve a saturated solution. And that means that we will get a high yield of our desired crystals. And then because we're using a hot solvent, crystals will form as that solvent cools. Now, because a lot of the solvents that we use are organic solvents, for instance, ethanol, which is flammable, it's important that we don't make our solvent hot by direct heating. And not only that, it's important that we keep our solvent at temperatures below its boiling point. And so for ethanol, that would be below 78 degrees C. When we're choosing a suitable solvent, it's important first and foremost that this solvent actually dissolves the organic solid that we're seeking to purify. Not only that, our solid needs to be highly soluble at high temperatures for this organic solvent, but also have a low solubility at low temperatures. And in addition to this, we would ideally have a solvent where the impurities are still soluble in that solvent even at a low temperature. Once we've dissolved our crude organic solid, we need to filter it whilst it's still hot. This will remove any insoluble impurities from our solution, and it will also take place, if we do it while it's still hot, before any crystals have started to form. Because if crystals had formed and then we filter it, we would actually be filtering out some of the crystals that we want to produce. And then we would allow our filtrate to cool and we would leave it somewhere to crystallize, potentially in some cold water or an ice bath or a mixture of the two. This will increase the yield of crystals that form. And so our yield of aspirin, for instance, will go up. And whilst the crystallization is occurring, ideally those soluble impurities would stay dissolved in that filtrate. And then once we've got our organic solid purified, it's still going to be mixed in with the filtrate. And so we need to remove it from the organic liquid. And so we would filter it under reduced pressure by doing something called suction filtration or vacuum filtration. And whilst it's in the Buchner funnel, we would wash it with cold solvent because this would remove those last traces of soluble impurities that could be stuck to the solid crystals.
And finally, having dried our purified aspirin or purified organic solid, we would test its purity by measuring its melting point. We would record the dry mass that we'd obtained and use that value to calculate our percentage yield. And our yield may not be 100% for a number of reasons. One reason why it might be less than 100% yield is we could have some product left behind in the glassware during the recrystallization process. A reason why it might seem like it's greater than 100% is that the sample might still have been wet when we found its mass after we'd done the suction filtration. And so if we hadn't dried it properly, there could still be some solvent in amongst those crystals, making us think that we had more purified solid than we actually did. It's very common as part of an organic synthesis to carry out filtration under reduced pressure, sometimes referred to as vacuum filtration. And we do this for a number of reasons. First of all, it's much faster than using gravity filtration. It also allows for improved separation, particularly of fine particles of a solid. And in general, it is more efficient because it allows for continuous filtration whilst it's connected up to a vacuum. Vacuum. You need to be able to describe and explain what happens during vacuum filtration and you also need to be able to draw the setup. When you draw a diagram of vacuum filtration, always draw a two-dimensional cross-section. Don't try to do anything creative. The essential ingredients to this diagram are the Buckner funnel, which is going to sit inside a special conical flask. It's going to have a bung around the stem of the funnel to make sure there are no air gaps. And we're going to connect our special conical flask through its sidearm to a vacuum pump and put a piece of filter paper into the Buckner funnel itself. And then we pour the liquid that we're going to filter the solid out of into the top of the Buckner funnel and turn on the vacuum pump. And sometimes this might just be as simple as turning on a tap and allowing the movement of water to draw the air through the filter funnel and pull the liquid down into the conical flask. And so the filtrate will move through the filter paper. And this is normally the part that we don't need in the suction filtration. And then the solid will be left behind on the filter paper. We will normally wash our solid with cold solvent, typically the solvent that we've been using earlier on in our organic synthesis. And it's really important that this is a cold solvent because if we'd used hot or warm solvent, we could potentially dissolve our aspirin that we're trying to collect. Sometimes it might be necessary to compress the crystals that are collecting on the filter paper. This ensures the air passes through the crystals rather than around them and it leads to better drying and faster, more efficient drying as a result. The most common way of testing the purity of an organic substance is to measure its melting point. To do this you need to use something called a melting point apparatus although you could also use an oil bath or something called a Thiel's tube. To use the melting point apparatus, you need to put the solid organic compound inside a capillary tube. And this is a thin glass tube that is sealed at one end. And once you've got your solid into the capillary tube, you put it into the melting point apparatus, which has got a slot specially designed to accept capillary tubes. And there's a viewing window so you can see the solid inside the capillary tube magnified and so you can clearly see the solid crystals. There's also a thermometer so you know what the temperature is inside the melting point apparatus. And to operate it, you turn it on and very slowly increase the temperature of the apparatus. And what will happen is gradually those solid crystals will get warmer and warmer and then they will start to collapse and melt and turn into a liquid. And you need to note the temperature that this process starts and the process that it finishes happening. And then you record that melting point and repeat several times and calculate a mean. One benefit of using capillary tubes for this process is they are made of very thin glass. And so this means that we can be quite confident that the temperature inside the tube, so the temperature of the crystals, matches the temperature that the machine is reporting. 
You don't need to memorize any specific values for melting points, but you could be asked to comment on how you could know whether a sample of aspirin was pure or not. And what you would say is if you had a pure substance of aspirin, you would expect the solid to collapse to a liquid at one specific temperature, and therefore you'd expect it to have a sharp, very precise melting point. Or they could say benzoic acid is a solid. How would you expect its melting point to be influenced if it was an impure solid? What would you expect to note? And so if this benzoic acid was impure, you would expect its melting point to be lower than a pure substance. Not only that, you'd expect it to melt over a range of different temperatures. And so you wouldn't get that sharp melting point and quick melting that you'd expect to get for a pure substance. And if the organic substance was a liquid and you were measuring its boiling point, you would expect again it to boil over a range of different temperatures. But this time you would expect the boiling point to be higher than it is for the pure substance. The most common impurity in an organic solid is the solvent that you used in the recrystallization process. So typically this will be either water or ethanol. In order to remove the solvent, we could press the sample, those crystals between filter papers, or we could leave it for a long time in order to air dry and for that solvent to evaporate. As well as having a quantitative measure of the purity, you could also make a qualitative evaluation of how pure the crystals look. For instance, if crystals were pure, you would expect to see larger crystals than you would if they were impure. And also those crystals would be whiter and they would be a single colour than you would expect from impure crystals. So impure aspirin, for instance, can look grey and quite a dull colour. And also pure crystals are more needle-like looking crystals, whereas impure can typically look quite powdery. When preparing an organic liquid, we often get layers forming. Since our organic liquid is immiscible with water, and that means it doesn't mix with water. And we can say that the organic liquid is hydrophobic, or we might refer to it as being insoluble in water. And this is very common, especially when there is either a very long carbon chain or because the functional group can't form hydrogen bonds with water. Whatever the reason, the organic liquid and the aqueous solution don't mix together. And so they need to be separated from each other. And to do this, we use a separating funnel and we will end up with two layers inside the separating funnel. The layer at the bottom will be the one that has got the higher density and the one on the top will be the lower density. And typically the upper layer is likely to be the organic liquid. Commonly, we'll be doing this separation because we want to keep the organic layer as part of a preparation of an organic liquid. So we want the top layer, but we don't want the aqueous layer. And so we need to discard this aqueous layer by running it off into a conical flask and then collecting the organic layer in a second conical flask. And having done this, the organic layer may contain some water and so therefore need an extra purification step involving drying this organic liquid. Organic synthesis often involves an acid, either as a reactant or as a catalyst. And so we need to wash our organic liquid in order to remove this acid. And the substance that we use to do this is a solution of sodium carbonate. And this is used to wash the organic liquid and it will neutralize and remove the acid from the organic layer. The chemical equation for this is the hydrogen ions that are contaminating our organic liquid will react with the carbonate ions and we will produce carbon dioxide gas and water. This can cause a problem because the carbon dioxide gas could build up inside the separating funnel. 
And so what we need to do to prevent this happening is to invert the separating funnel, making sure the lid is still on, of course, and open the tap. And this will release the carbon dioxide gas and it will prevent the buildup of pressure inside the separating funnel because the carbon dioxide will rise up and escape and leave through the top of the separating funnel through the tap. When we've been preparing an organic liquid, it is quite common for the liquid that we've collected to still contain some water. And this could be because we had some kind of aqueous reactant, or it could be that we've got some of our sodium carbonate solution left over from the washing stage. Whatever the reason, we need to use some kind of drying agent to remove those last traces of water that weren't removed by the separating funnel. To do this, we add a drying agent, which is typically something either anhydrous calcium chloride or anhydrous magnesium sulfate. The drying agent's role is to absorb water and remove it from the organic liquid. And we can do this simply by getting a spatula of the calcium chloride and dropping it into our organic liquid. If there is water present in the organic liquid, the calcium chloride will clump together and fall very quickly to the bottom of the conical flask. Once all of that water has been removed, the next bits of calcium chloride that we add will float very slowly and gently to the bottom of the conical flask in the same sort of way that the bits of white solid do inside a snow globe once you've given it a shake. I've named two drying agents that we could use and it's important that we select suitable drying agents and these two are suitable first and foremost because they absorb water really well. In addition, they are insoluble in organic liquids and typically they are inert in organic liquids as well. So that means that we could select other drying agents other than these two provided they share these properties. Once we have successfully dried our organic liquid, we will need to remove the drying agent from it. And we would normally prefer to use vacuum filtration to do so, and that will successfully remove that drying agent, and we will be left with our organic liquid in the bottom of the conical flask, and this is our target organic liquid. One final thing that we can do with our organic liquid is test its purity. And we would be testing its boiling point here because it is, of course, a liquid. And we'd be looking for a very sharp, specific boiling point. And we'd be looking to make sure that it did not boil over a range of different temperatures. If it did, it would definitely be impure. OK, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.